Hello and welcome to CNN Business Traveller. I'm Richard Quest, this month reporting from Oslo, capital of Norway. Winter and travel. Two bedfellows that don't go together without trouble and strife. So this month we're all about how to keep moving when the weather turns bad. Coming up, the masters of winter maintenance show me how it's done. This is truly terrifying. We see how an aircraft is built to withstand freezing conditions. And tips to keep yourself charged up if you're caught in delays. It is winter in Oslo and Norway's main airport, Gardermoen, is humming beautifully. There are no major cancellations, no long delays, because this airport is the gold standard for winter operations. A synchronized dance on a challenging stage, elegant choreography, military timing, in just 15 minutes, a runway cleared of snow and fit for flight. This is Oslo Airport's state-of-the-art fleet. 27 vehicles, including two of the world's largest snow blowers. We have uh, two of the TV2000, and uh, this one is the newest. It's, it's arrived yesterday. It's huge. Yes, it's uh, weight, uh, it's 40 tons. 40 tons and more than a million dollars, and they're willing to let me have a go. Yeah, where's the start button? You really feel this whole thing just moving the snow and then suddenly slowing down. It's extraordinary. Keeping things moving, whatever the weather. In a climate that can be brutally unforgiving, this is one airport that can't afford to be beaten by snow. It is as easy as this. We have winters six months at a year, and we need to be able to handle winter operations more or less like summer operations. It requires good planning, a lot of resources, good procedures, and a lot of training. The strategy is to keep one runway open at all times, whatever it takes. When your advisors and your staff come up to you and they say, we need another two machines, I'm guessing they don't have to push too hard before you sort of sign off on it. That is being signed very, very quickly. We have a policy to have state-of-the-art equipment at all times. Putting winter maintenance first is an easy decision when snow is your norm. For those airports where it's rare and doesn't drive policy, the consequences are all too familiar. This winter again, Europe was hit with severe disruption. And more delays, especially in Frankfurt. And hundreds, in some cases thousands, of flights were cancelled at major hub airports. In Europe there's heavy falls that are causing widespread travel delays. Across the Atlantic, an ever more dismal picture. Of destruction. In October last year, Hurricane Sandy caused the loss of hundreds of lives, ripping through this community, tens of billions of dollars worth of damage. In February, the bad weather returned. We're gonna have to deal with some nasty wintry weather, with storms wreaking havoc over the northeast. More than 5,000 flights canceled, grounding thousands of flights in one weekend. President Obama announced a state of emergency. Here in Oslo, it's business as usual. When the bad weather starts and hits. Are you in favour of airlines starting to cancel proactively? Because that will make it easier for you. Basically, yes. If they can be proactive and, ca uh, and cancel early, it's better for the airport, but it's also better for the passengers because then they know what to plan for. By the time the ploughs do their business, everyone's been prepared for hours. Tracking winter weather is essential for airports and airlines so that by the time the first flake falls, everyone's ready. Aisha Dergahi reports from Brussels. 41 countries with 64 air traffic control centres handling up to 30,000 flights a day. 
Coordinating all this traffic is Eurocontrol, where today the weather is the cause of 84% of delays. In total, 13,700 minutes of delay, and of those are 11,500 due to weather. Every plane and every weather front are tracked 48 hours in advance. That gives a good uh, opportunity for the airlines to prepare for delays maybe, for problems with passenger connections and stuff like that. You know, then it's up to the airline to decide are they able to take this delay. We know the implications for the airline financially and, and I mean imagine if uh, you have to put ground the whole flight. Grounding flights means grounding passengers. In 2007, in what became known as the Valentine's Day blizzard, JetBlue passengers at Newark Airport were stuck on a plane for more than eight hours. New regulations were put in place, enforcing a three-hour tarmac rule that fines airlines $27,500 a passenger if they break it. We fought hard for that three-hour rule here in Washington. We've come a long way as an industry uh, over the last two or three years even, but certainly in the last ten years, into making the traveler more empowered when they're on the road uh, than they ever were. Ashplume has completely closed In Europe, airspace. passenger rights under EU 261 became a confusing and contentious issue during the volcanic ash in 2010 that cost the airlines $1.7 billion in lost revenue. The airlines became the insurers of last resort rather unfairly because there was a lot of evidence that areas were free of ash but the airlines were denied um, the right to fly, they had to compensate people. Now under the terms of um, EU 261. The passenger rights, as I understand them, are that they must be looked after the passengers in the care and assistance. That could be meal vouchers, um, drinks, coffees, all that, that sort of thing, but not compensation. Lessons were also learned here at Eurocontrol, where they now have better communication between airlines, airports and air traffic control with its crisis centre. We have not had the same disruption in bad weather since 2010. Airports have invested a lot of money in extra de-icing equipment, snow clearing equipment, so their ability to react to adverse weather is much better than it was back 2009-2010. After the break, the runway's cleared, and now we de-ice the planes. Welcome back to CNN Business Traveller. We've seen how they clear all the snow from the runway. Now let's see how they de-ice the planes so they can fly. We have the nozzle that you control with a joystick. Ice building up on the wings and tail of a plane is downright dangerous as it disturbs airflow during takeoff. Ah, like this. Right. Now we are set in a de icing position. When the temperature like drops this. below three degrees, the trucks are called in to pelt the plane with antifreeze. So that actually moves the nozzle. Yeah. This moves the arm. Got it? <laughs> it really isn't easy, is it? No, it's, uh, it takes some getting used to. With trepidation, Sorry, I'd be right. <laughs> I make my way gingerly towards the aircraft. This is truly terrifying. Here I am with a large piece of machinery heading towards $50 million worth of aircraft. The average de icing takes just a few minutes. Now, in reality, how much more would, you, would that, that would be enough? Yeah. My attempt takes a lot longer, but I'm told not bad for a first go. The amount of technology on the ground to handle bad weather is extraordinary. And the plane itself, of course, is designed to fly in the most extreme circumstances. As Aisha Durga, he explains. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good uh, afternoon to you from the Air Flight Deck. This is your captain. An in-flight forecast from the front of the plane. Well, it's a bit cloudy, I'm afraid. A light drizzle and uh, brisk uh, northerly wind. Once the seatbelt sign is on, we can get back to enjoying a meal or a movie, because the planes we fly in are designed to battle the elements that can suddenly cross their path. 
There is one lightning strike every second around the world. Every single aircraft is hit by lightning once a year. Here at Cardiff University in Wales, lightning strikes every day, where capacitors discharge a current of 100,000 amps in a microsecond, recreating the power of a lightning bolt at altitude. The aluminium body of an aircraft is highly conductive and acts as a Faraday cage, a metallic shield that directs the electric charge outside towards the back of the plane. And the passengers on board won't feel a thing. This $2 million lightning lab in partnership with EADS and the Welsh Government tests different conductor strips on the nose of the plane and new composite materials found on modern aircraft. There is a thin layer of copper mesh that allows it to do the conduction duties. On top of the composite material? On top of the composite ah, material. So then without the copper material, that's what w you get? Without it, if you had a lightning strike to the carbon composite on its own, you can see how the damage can be extensive. Whereas if you have the metal mesh, you can see that the lightning strike is hardly noticed on the surface uh, oh, because thanks. it conducts yeah. very efficiently. Another built-in defence mechanism is using the heat from the engines to melt ice around them and along the edge of the wings. And here at Cranfield University, they have an ice tunnel. Minus 10 degrees Celsius with a wind speed of 100 miles per hour. They can see how ice builds up and understand its aerodynamic qualities. What we'd find is that generally the ice that forms uh, in this area here, it can be quite thin, but the ice which forms a little bit further back can be a lot thicker, which actually reverses the curvature of the leading edge. Changes the shape of the wing, essentially. Quite dramatically in some cases, yes, unless you do something to prevent it. So with an aircraft, typically you'll work out which parts of the aircraft are most critical aerodynamically, and then make sure that they're protected. The size of wire mesh used to prevent ice building up in the fuel tanks before it's heated up on the way to the engines is also an area being extensively researched here. There's always little bit of efficiencies that we can build in to get better performance for the passengers and for the environment. As well as freezing temperatures, aircraft can cope when dry cold air collides with rising warm moist air. In other words, turbulence. The aircraft slightly rolls and pitches. Here at Imperial College London, it's the landing phase, though, that's the most critical during crosswinds and wind shear. An aircraft is typically 40% heavier than it need be. It is, in a sense, overdimensioned. The roots of the wing are very thick in order to withstand extreme conditions of turbulence. When you fly an aircraft which seems to be out of control, the aircraft structure is sufficiently strong to withstand any of this. When it comes to aircraft design and weather, at research level, there are men and women dedicating their lives to specific weather conditions to ensure planes are built to buffer and bear the harshest of conditions. And then it's up to the pilots to do the rest. So, built for purpose and safe for flight. Now the plane has to be guided in and out of the airport safely. And that means the control tower. More than accustomed to Norway's winters, the controllers at Gardermoen are unfazed by snow. It's just normal operations, really. So uh, I, I wouldn't consider snow as a difficult condition for us. The runway normally gets a little more slippery. The aircraft will need uh, some more time to get off the runway and uh, then we need some increased spacing just to make, the f make sure that they are actually off the runway before the next one is landing. In the end, the final decision to land rests with the pilot. So coming up after the break, making that decision during a flight's most challenging moment. Oh, for goodness sir, are you seriously going to land in this? Welcome back to CNN Business Traveller in Oslo. Here they have mastered the art of handling bad weather. For the pilots, though, there are different challenges. They may have taken off in the heat of the desert and are now landing in the depths of winter. And then they have to do it all over again, possibly in reverse. So I've come to the simulators to learn how pilots learn to handle the really rough stuff.
for now. The airplane starts to move. At the CAE simulators, we're practicing takeoff and landings, the most dangerous moments of flight. V1 rotates. And you rotate the airplane up to the flight director. What are the major challenges in bad weather? The icing conditions is, of course, to make sure you don't get ice on the wings or the engines. Where are you going to land again? How is the runway conditions? Are you able to stop the airplane? But we have all kinds of information here you need to fly in, in cloud conditions or at night time, in snowstorm, blizzard, what have you. All right. I don't see any runway. At this stage, most pilots will disconnect the autopilot and auto and land himself. We've upped the ante a bit here and we are now bouncing around. Yes. Are you worried yet? No, but I'm working hard. Oh, for goodness sake. <laughs> Are you seriously going to land in this? At the oh. moment, yes, we will try to do this. At what point it, will you change your mind? Because we're still on the glide pass. We have the speed we're supposed to have. In the last seconds, Captain Peterson makes the decision and aborts the landing. So now we'll do a go-around. It is unsafe for this stage to continue landing. The art there is not the flying. The art is knowing to do the go-round. Oh, yes. And not to continue oh, yes. thinking, I've got to do it, I've got to get in. After circling once, he makes a second attempt, factoring the wind, air temperature, aircraft weight, and most important, runway conditions. A failure to land now means sending us to an alternate airport. Did you ever have any doubts on that one? No, not at all. Of course you get a little bit more tense because you have to work harder and you have to be sure that you are able to do what you already have learned. So don't be afraid. Buy a ticket any time. When the conditions are tough, it is the pilot who makes the final decision on whether it's safe to fly. And when they decide to stay on the ground, it's not long before the effects are felt right here in the terminal. Passengers, sometimes thousands of them, all waiting for flights. Here are some tips on how you can help yourself to be the first one out. When I wake up before I go on a big trip, I always check the weather. You got to do your research. So you, got, you need to know the weather of where you are, where you're going, and any layover airports that you're traveling to. It's really important. First of all, you need to go to every airline's website that you're flying and sign up to their notifications. Almost every airline offers these for free. They're going to, they're going to put it out in their Twitter feed first. What's important about that is that if there is any delays or cancellations, you're going to be the first one to know. In the airport and your flight has been canceled and there's a long line to get booked into a hotel you know you can go on to certain apps like one of my favorites is hotel tonight they have over three million downloads and what they do is they will uh, they have 70% off at hotels after 12 o'clock that day it's only for that night but you can get 70% off One of the best tips you can do is not check a bag because that saves you a lot of time and money. First of all, if there is a flight delay, you, you can't change your flight that easy if you check the bag. The trick is to wear the heavy stuff on the plane. Oslo, a capital that spends up to half the year under a blanket of snow, turned to its advantage on the hills overlooking the city. This is what you call a layover. This is Oslo Winter Park. Just 20 minutes from downtown, it has 18 slopes and caters to skiers of all levels. <laughs> the great part about skiing here is that you're skiing amongst the locals. The bad part is some of them seem to have been born with skis on their feet. It's often just when you're relaxing, having fun, that the batteries die on you. Which brings us to a final set of tips. When the battery dies, 
whether because of the cold or delays. And you need that little bit of extra juice so you can tell them what time you'll arrive. There are various options to give you a boost. Let's try some of them out. So take the AA one. It's straightforward. This is the emergency charger. It's a bit fiddly. That red light is on. Oh, Once the connection's in, you're off. And it's working. Cheap, easy to pack, and you can pick up a AA battery anywhere. This one is from Duracell. You have to remember to charge it up. That goes on there. It is charging up. Fast and efficient. Just remember, you have to recharge it or it's nothing more than a paperweight. Then we have what could be the most promising. Ha! Ah, the wind-up charger. At first blush, I really, really like this. It seemed to have it all. I've not managed to get it enough charging. It just doesn't seem to be doing anything. love the idea but I'm not sure it actually works. Finally the buns, the more robust ones. This is the Solar Monkey Adventurer. As it sounds, takes from the sun. Plug it in, no question about it, it's charging up. And because it's solar powered, no pre-planning required, you just literally take it with you. Finally, the Crosscast Solar Backpack. It has the solar panel. We'll use the BlackBerry for this one. And that's charging again. The delight of this one, of course, is that you can throw everything in there while you're skiing or while you're just going about your normal day. And it will be charging while you're on the way. Charged and ready to go back to the slopes. There's a few final hours of skiing before my next flight. And that's CNN Business Traveller for this month. I'm Richard Quest in Oslo. Wherever your travels may take you, I hope they're profitable. And I'll ski you next month. <laughs>